I love you too. Jesus. Love you guys too. Come on. God is good. Praise God. Who loves Jesus in this place? Come on, man. Well, guys, I'm super excited to be with you. It's a little poignant moment for me. Uh, as you guys know, this is uh, the last time that you'll have to enjoy my preaching. So some people may be happy, some not so happy, but I'm sad anyway. I don't know if anybody else is, but I'm, but I'm sad. But I'm sad, but also excited because whenever God speaks, uh, it's always going to be fun, huh? But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a double-edged sword for sure, but I'm, I'm sad to not be able to speak uh, to you guys anymore because you have all become a family to me and my family. Um, we love you guys very much, and that, one, that won't change. We'll still love you. And, uh, wh- you know, whatever the Lord does on our journey, we will always, a piece of our heart will always be here. And, uh, you know, I'm not just saying that, but it's, it's true. You know, we love you guys and what you have done uh, as a church family to me and my family is uh, enable us really to take this next uh, chapter of our lives, to step into this next chapter can only happen because of what this house has provided for us, bringing us from uh, Ireland to here and basically just making a, us a family to you guys, enabling us to kind of grow in our giftings and grow in our ministry into this nation uh, really is because of what we're going into now is because of, of what you guys have, have allowed to happen and stewarded. So I just want to thank you, Pastor Jonathan, Pastor Aaron, Pastor Casey, and, uh, and your beautiful wives, and uh, Pastor Chris, who's coming back soon. Uh, but I just want to thank all you, all you leaders here and uh, everybody really who's involved. You know, I'm, just, um, I'm mentioning the leaders because I don't have enough time to go through everybody, but you guys all know who you are. But there's a lot of people in this house who have made a, a big difference in mine, not only my life, but my wife's as well, um, equally. So we just want to thank you guys. You know, I know I thank you a lot, but hey, I'm going to keep thanking you. And even when I'm not here, I'll be still thanking you. In my book, I, I wrote a book called Jesus at the Door. In my book, I put thank you to the Promised Church for showing me what the best church in the world looks like. And, uh, and I mean that. I meant it when I wrote it. I mean it to this day. Uh, this place is incredible. You guys are very blessed to be part of this church. You're very, very blessed to be part of a family of, of people who love Jesus, of a leadership who have pure hearts to run after Jesus. And, uh, and it's been an honor of mine uh, and my families to have been planted here. And um, I just want you guys to know that, that we really treasure you and we love you. And it's, uh, it, mean, it means a lot to us, what you guys have done. And, and uh, yeah, we have grown so much here, you know. And I could just take the morning to just talk about this. But I'm going to give a word, what the Lord's put on my heart. But, uh, but I just want you to know. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, Lord, I just want to thank you. Lord, I just honor this church. Lord, I honor this family, the promised church. Lord, I just love this church, and I just thank you for this church, and I just thank you for the way that they have loved so well, not only me and my family, but the way that they love everybody who comes into these doors so well, and I thank you for the integrity that is uh, in the foundations of this this church and in this family, and I thank you, Lord, that this is only only warm-up season. Uh, Lord, I, I, I just see a picture of, uh, you know, somebody on the, on the, an athlete on the sidelines warming up. And I kind of feel that what we have seen so far has just been a warm-up season for what is coming. So, Holy Spirit, I just want to thank you, Lord. I thank you that you don't make mistakes. I thank you that you are perfect in every way. I thank you that you make the perfect connections. And I just want to thank you publicly, Lord, for um, connecting me and my family with this family. Lord, I just thank you for doing what you did and, and the way you did it that, that seemed so random, but we all knew that it was you. So we just thank you, Holy Spirit, I thank you, Lord, that you enabled us to be planted here. You enabled my family to be planted here to receive the love and, and respect and honor and everything that you wanted to just flood us with. So I'm just, I just want to thank you, Lord, for that. And, uh, and I'm just excited for what you're going to do in this place. And we're going to be cheering you on and and uh, so I just thank you, Jesus. We love you. Praise you. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Whew. Come on. I was kind of torn between what to say this morning. What, one idea was that I'll just take 35, 40 minutes and just thank you all and hug you all and kiss you all and that kind of stuff, you know. Like, you know, 
wash everybody's feet and whatever. But my wife probably suggested that I probably shouldn't do that. And maybe I should try and speak so that I can keep it together a little. Because uh, I might, you know, be very undignified if I go down that road. So uh, I trust my wife. She speaks a lot of wisdom. So I'm going to try and speak and, and bring the word of the Lord. There's something that God has really been inspiring me with recently in a passage of scripture, the feeding of the 5,000 or the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. We all know it, I'm sure. But it's something the Holy Spirit's really been giving me a new insight into and new angles to. So I want to share that with you guys because it's really been inspiring me and I would like to give it away to you. So we're going to read, I believe, from the book of Matthew. I think we have this passage of scripture ready to read from Matthew Matthew 14, 15 will be the last time that I will look at this screen. Maybe not the last time, because I'm sure I'm going to be back, huh? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you ain't got no choice. I'm coming back whether you want me or not. So I'm just going to like rush the stage and, and say I'm, I'm going to come and speak. Okay. Matthew 14, 15 to, uh, 15 to 22, we read this. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we here have only five loaves and two fishes. He said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes, sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and two fish and he looked up to heaven. He blessed and broke it and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave it to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those, those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. And the last verse, immediately, everyone say immediately. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So this miracle here, the miracle of the 5,000, the, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, this miracle here was the only miracle that all of the, all of the four gospels attested to. All the four gospel writers documented this miracle alone. What was it about this miracle that captured the heart of the disciples? What was it about this miracle that captured the Holy Spirit's heart to say, this miracle must be canonized in scripture? What was so unique about this particular miracle? Well, I believe, I believe it was this. We read, before we read the passage we read, we hear that John the Baptist had been beheaded. This is the prelude to this. John the Baptist had been beheaded. John the Baptist was uh, Jesus' cousin. And, uh, and at, the, at the news of his death, when the disciples came and informed Jesus of John's death, what did he do? He wanted to get away. So he took a, he took a, a boat and he went away to get some solitude, to get some peace, to have a time alone with the Father. Who knows that we need time alone with the Father? Amen. So Jesus went to have that time with the Father. While he was there, the crowds began to come. Now he's in that moment, if anyone deserved uh, that peace, if anyone deserved that time with the, with the Father, it was Jesus, huh? Because he was given constantly. So he's in that place with the Father and the crowds come and what happens? We read the compassion. Everyone say compassion. Compassion moved the hand of Jesus. It was compassion that caused Jesus to change his plans. See, sometimes in life we have a schedule. We have like, man, I'm going to do this today. I'm going to go to Walmart. I'm going to get my groceries. I'm on the clock. I've got to get back to the wife. But sometimes compassion will change your schedule. You may be walking through the grocery store and you're on the clock, but you see somebody and what happens when you look at them? Compassion happens. And you're like, man, actually, I want to speak to that person. So you go and speak to them. You can't help yourself because compassion gets a hold of you. And this is where we read, this is what we read, the, 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 ba the base camp, the, the prelude, the foundation, the springboard into this miracle is compassion. And Jesus is in a moment of compassion and he begins to share. You know, uh, the, the feeding of the 5,000 for me, I don't really see it. Uh, I see it in a deeper level. I believe Jesus was trying to touch at something deeper. I also believe this. I also believe the hunger, the hunger in man stirs the heart of God. When God sees a hunger in a man or a woman, he's drawn to that person. There is something about hunger in the eyes of God that he wants to get close. When you begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness, what happens? 
you'll be filled. He shows up for sure. Come on. When you thirst and hunger for righteousness, Jesus said, on the Sermon of the Mount, you will be filled. So when we have a hunger inside of us, it is like, it is like a beacon. It is like a flare to heaven. It says, okay, over there. I'm going over there. And there was a hunger in the side of mankind. There's a hunger in the heart of man. Not only physically, not only for food, but really underlined was the hunger for God. So Jesus used the miracle of the fish and the, the loaves and the fish really to highlight a deeper hunger that was in the soul of man. Also, another thing, this was the, uh, the nine, chronologically, this was the 19th miracle that Jesus had done. So he'd done 18 miracles previously. Now, this is beautiful because the disciples had been with Jesus for 18 miracles. We know the first one, the wedding at Cana, when Jesus turned the water into the wine, the stone pots, and, and they became wine, yeah? So imagine that one. The disciples are like looking on that one like, this is crazy. He's just turned water into wine. That was miracle number one. I ain't going to go through them all. But you fast forward down to number 19, you've got the loaves and the fishes. What was, what was Jesus trying to show? I believe this. I believe those first 18 miracles were a training ground for the disciples. 18 miracles that they got to watch up close and personal and see Jesus working his hand of miracles as they watched close on. They weren't involved, but they were privy to it. For 18 miracles, because God is kind and he likes to give you lots of, lots of time to be around his spirit and his presence before he launches you out. The difference with miracle number 19 is that they were the ones who were partaking in the miracle. The 18 miracles they looked on, number 19, they're involved. They are actually doing the work of the, they are becoming miracle workers, if you like, because Jesus brings them in to the miracle. What is significant about this? I'm going to tell you why. When you partner with God, it changes everything. You see, I've seen many miracles in my life. Who's seen miracles? Who likes miracles? Come on, amen. I love watching miracles happen. But the greatest miracle is salvation. That is the greatest miracle. I don't care who you are, what you say. That is the greatest miracle that can happen when a man or woman gets born again, their name gets written in heaven's book of life. That is the greatest miracle, okay? But I'm, a, I'm down with all miracles. Like if it's the hand of God, I'm in. But the greatest miracle is that. But when you see miracles like I used to see miracles, uh, you know, in my early days as a believer from other people. People getting saved from other people, people getting healed. Like I'm observing these miracles, you know. And I'm like, this is crazy, man. I'm watching it. It's like fueling my faith. But when I was the guy in the miracle, like everything went next level. Like it was a new stratosphere. I'm like, God is using me to, to be involved in this miracle. Like he's actually will use me in this miracle. This is crazy, man. I didn't know that. I was allowed to, to kind of do that, you know. It, take, it took my faith levels to a whole new level. And this is what's happening with the disciples. Jesus begins to bring them in because, you see, he wants partnership out of you. That's what he's looking for. He doesn't just want to do it all and, and you're standing on the sidelines going, Jesus, you're amazing, and you never do it. No, he created you for partnership. He created you for relationship. So he wants to bring you in. And I want to tell you this, wherever there is partnership, there is power. You bring the partnership and he'll bring the power. It is the same with evangelism. It is the same with Christian, anything in Christianity that, that is good and that is kingdom-like is partnership. And this is what Jesus is demonstrating here, I believe, with the disciples. And um, the disciples, what do they say to Jesus? They say, basically, look, we've got a problem. All the people need feeding. All these people are hungry. 5,000, you're more like 20,000. It was 5,000 uh, plus women and children. So you've got like 20,000 scholars reckon, hungry people. Now the disciples have a problem. We've got a problem right now, yeah? Like if you ever had a spiritual need or, or a need and you're like, God, like this is too big for me. I can't deal with this one. I really need some help right now, yeah? I've been in some sticky situations in my life as a believer where I'm like, God, if you don't get me out of this one, I'm in trouble. Like I need you to step in right now. Well, it was one of those. They're in this 20,000 people and, and they're like, what are we going to do? Let's go to Jesus. Please help us, Jesus. They go, Jesus, we need some help, yeah? What does he do? He says, no, 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 you go and help him. You see, they were looking for Jesus to solve all their problems. And Jesus was like, I've given you what you need to get the job done. Stop coming to me. You go and do it. And they were like, well, well, we don't have much, Lord. We don't have much, you know, we don't really have many resources. You know, our church ain't that big. You know, I mean, I don't, I've only been a believer a short time. I, I'm not even in ministry. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I don't have much to give you. And he's like, well, just give me what you got. 
Whatever you've got, I don't mind, I'll take it. Because, again, it's about the partnership. It's not about the level of what you're bringing. It's about just bring something. So they go. Jesus says, now you go and give me, what have you got? And he comes and he gives them the five loaves and the two fish. He gives them the boy sack lunch. We all know the story. But what I love about this is that we end up with 12 baskets left over. And I believe that was Jesus just saying this. I don't care if it's even one fish. Because I've got like so much extra. Like he's just demonstrating the excess that God has. So he's like, man, you got five loaves, two fishes. That even produces 12 baskets over. Maybe you've only got one bit of bread. Hey, I don't care because I'm going to give you excess whatever you give me. I've got enough for every believer in every situation, no matter what you come up against. You remember when the, the, uh, the Israelites, they would go in the, um, they would camp in tents and they would go in the morning and they would receive manna that fell on the ground. It would rain down from heaven and this manna would be there. They would feed on it. And uh, every day there was fresh manna. But what they, what they sometimes wanted to do was collect it. You know, we have this thing in life where we want to store, Yeah. We're like, you know, we got a bit of money, let's put it away for a rainy day, you know what I'm saying? And we want to kind of keep things, but God's like, trust me every day. I'll be your sustenance, I'll provide for you every day. So they, the only day they could keep double was the day before the Sabbath. The day before the Sabbath, they could store double so that they didn't have to go out and collect it on the Sabbath. That was the only time. Every other time, every other day, he, gave, he provided that day what they needed. Because the arm of the Lord is not short to save. So we don't need... To live, and I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but we don't need to live off yesterday's miracle as well. God will do every day, give you exactly what you need. So the disciples began to realize that, man, okay, I don't want to have a whole lot. I've only got five loaves, two fish, but I'm going to give it to Jesus. They gave it to Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He multiplied it. But before he did that, you know what he did? He gave it back to them. You see, they gave what they had and he took it. He blessed it. He broke it. You see, because what, whatever you give to God, if you don't break, break it, you can't multiply it. So if you want to bring your life to God as a sacrifice, which is what you should do, Romans 12, 1, offer your, living, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, that is your act of worship. If you want to give a sacrifice to God of your life, He's got to break it. It needs to be broken before it can be multiplied. So once He breaks you, then He's going to multiply you. When I was a new believer, I had to go through some breaking processes before the Lord can multiply me. How does he multiply me? Well, what he does, he, he gives me and then I go and give it away. So what, the people I've led to Jesus, as some in this room and, and places, you know, what I've done is I've just gone and give, given what he's given me. And that was enough to feed them too, you know, because I had so much excess. So in your life, it does not matter what you have. I want to tell you this, you may have a little crumb. There is still, Jesus will use it and he will like change, he could change the world with the crumb because he's the God of multiplication. I want to share with you a true story of what happened uh, just to em- exemplify this. My son, you guys know my son Elijah, he's eight, eight years of age. And three weeks ago, this is about three weeks ago, we were in, uh, I was training a church in Rainier, not far from here. And we had like 30 minutes to go and share the gospel. Like, I'm not kidding, like 30 minutes it was like really on the clock, you know. So I take Elijah and, and, um, and my son, you know, he's, uh, he, he has a real passion for sharing the gospel. You know, I don't sit him down and like, you know, with one of those weird space helmets on and try and like, you know, uh, uh, brainwash him or something to make him do it. But he like, he's excited about it because he sees it. So anyway, he had his little Jesus at the door card and we go into, the, uh, into uh, Walmart, which was near where we were, the cl- one of the closest places. So we bounce over there and share the gospel. And he's got his card and I'm with two other gentlemen who would uh, come for the training. These two guys, a little nervous. So Elijah, he's like on ahead. And he goes in with his card and he goes over to a family. And he begins to share the gospel with the family. He reads his card. You may say, hey, well, maybe he shouldn't have read it. He should have looked them in the eye. He should have prayed for a healing, whatever, you know. But guess what? He just gave his little crumb. But Jesus multiplied it. So we came and he read the Jesus at the door card. He got to the second line and the gentleman he approached started crying. And I have a picture of that family that I can show you because the family accepted the Lord. There was a a man, his, his wife. Here we go, here we go. So I want actually, and even better, we have the family here. So John and Rob, Robin coming up, and I want you guys to meet my friends. This is, this is John and Robin. 
who have been part of our community for the past three weeks. And I want, the, I want you guys to hear, because this is a perfect example for me, like of a young boy, a young boy who did not have much to offer. Because many of us are like, man, I don't have much to give. I just want, I just want uh, John and Robin, just that you guys in your own words, because I know you both had an encounter with the Lord in that moment. But, but you know, I just want you to share what, what you felt in that moment when, that, when my little boy was sharing with you, and then what's happened since then. Well, uh, so... Sorry. Um, when uh, when they came up to us, you know, I've I've always known who Jesus was. I've always loved him, but I'm always backsliding, going back and forth. And uh, and uh, when they came up to us and he started talking, I just I felt something strong tugging at my heart. He's saying, "I need you to come back to me," and uh, and so I did. I cried and I talked to this man, and then I went to a meeting and I went to the meeting and I confessed. You know, I had been I had been drinking every day. I smoked cigarettes, and I just I wanted to stop. And I gave it to God. And since then, I haven't drank. I don't drink. I don't smoke cigarettes. My life is totally it's changed. And my family we're so much closer. We read the Bible now. We turn off the TV. We eat our dinner. We read, and you know, just it's amazing. It's amazing what God can do. And like I just feel them right now, you know, it's just it's just crazy. And I just love being here, and I love all you guys. You know, Jesus is good every day. Uh, <laughs> I also um, I was born and raised in Texas, so I was I was raised in Southern Baptist um, Church. Always forced to go. So when I got to a certain age where I could decide, you know, it was just like no, like. It, it just didn't seem for me. Um, I went through a lot of struggles as an adult, and I had lost my way for a really long time. But um, that day when Elijah approached us, it felt like um, there was like this really powerful force field ar- around him. And the minute that he got within distance and started talking to us about God, like we we're included inside of that force field, if that makes sense. Sorry. <laughs> um, and it just felt like a, a really tight hug from somewhere where I, I couldn't see, but I could feel. And uh, ever since then, so um, any conversations, um, I mean, like his... His presence is there always in our conversations and in our relationships and the daily things that we do. Um, when we read our devotionals now at night, that we never used to do just me and him, you know, in bed at night. Um, I've started waking up early in the morning um, so I can have time to myself to read my Bible and... and Amazing. Come on. And, uh, let me share about, about your son too. So this, so this was really amazing that John had said to me, look, I'm kind of concerned about, uh, about our son. You know, he's just been going through some stuff. And they got him to come to our new believers group like, um, uh, like a week or two ago. And he said, well, you can tell the story. Um, <laughs> so if you have teenagers, you might already know. <laughs> um, they're going through changes. But so we've been having issues with um, lying right? White lies, big lies, small lies, lies that shouldn't matter, but they happen anyways, you know. (laughs) Um, So that's kind of been an ongoing um, struggle with me and his dad and and Riley. Well, we took him to the first um, new believers group. Uh, It was here. And uh, he he swore up and down, like, I'm not going to say anything. I don't want to share. I don't want to share, you know, our whole drive here from Longview. Even walking through the doors until we got into the room. Like, he's like, no, 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 no. Even, even had his hood on. <laughs> yeah. <downstairs>. Like, <laughs> um, but as soon as, like, a, a few people had went by, like, he raised his hand. And I'm sitting here in my head. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what's going to come out of his mouth? Like, what is he going to say? Um, and he asked us to forgive him and admitted in front of all these people that he never met before. Mind you, he's... 13 in a group full of adults and admitted that he had a problem and that he wanted to fix it. Which was a big answer to prayer for you, huh? Yeah. Because I know that had been heavy on your heart. So come on, isn't that incredible, huh? 
So come on. So we're just thankful, so thankful for what God is doing in your guys' lives. And then also, for the first time in their lives, they're going to get baptized, huh? Yeah. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to baptize these beautiful people. But it's not amazing, huh? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I never get bored of that stuff. I mean, you know, like Jesus changing lives, families being restored. You know, uh, these guys have been part of our church family for like three weeks or so. I, I was in Florida a couple of weeks ago, and you know, John called me, you know, sent me a picture when, in my hotel room. You know, we're like three hours ahead, and he was just, uh, you know, sent me a picture. They went out and got a Bible, and them two together reading the Bible, and you know, he calls me, we're praying over the phone and just, just amazing to see, you know, but like I say, man, like it was Elijah going up with the gospel that opened this thing up because he, he only had something small, but it was enough for Jesus to multiply. And I just want to encourage you guys. I know I'm like a broken record, but I'm going to keep being a broken record until every single person in this church or every church that I set foot in begins to do this because until it happens, we're not living the lives that we should be living. Because eight-year-old boys are getting to experience what God intended for every single one of you sat in these seats right now. On Tuesday night, the first New Believers group John came to was Jeremy and Amanda's in Longview. That was his first. I met him on a Saturday and then he came on the, the Tuesday. And I came and I told Elijah that John was coming. So he came because he wanted to see John being there. He wanted to see the fruit of what he had done. And I want to tell you guys, man, that this is what the Lord has for you. The Lord wants to raise you up so you can partake in this great hunger in, in mankind to fill the void. So I just want to share one more thing. So this is the, one of the big things the Holy Spirit has been showing me in this passage. So the, the partnership of the disciples with Jesus. But this is kind of like the, uh, the, the title of the talk, moving from your miracle moment. So I believe this. When the disciples had this moment with Jesus, it was one of those like line in the sand moments. 18 miracles before watching. Number 19, now I'm involved. Now I'm the guy being uh, partaking in the miracle. Everything's changing from this moment. Now, there is a moment in your life that happens when you have your monumental miracle moment. Now, that could be your salvation. For me, it was. It could be your healing. Uh, God uses you to heal uh, someone to get healed. Uh, you, you get healed, whatever. There's a moment in your Christian walk when it's like lying in the sand, I ain't going back. From here on out, I'm going to live this thing differently. I'm going to express myself differently. I'm going with a new vigor, with a new focus. There's a moment like that that comes to the Christian. And this, I believe, this was the disciples' monumental moment. This was the moment where they're like, man, from now on, I can't go back from now on. I'm going to see things differently. Like I've seen God use me to feed these people. Like I, I, this is different. This is taking it to a new level. But then there is something really key in this. You see, Jesus says this in the, in the, in the verse that we ended on. In verse 22, Jesus said this. He says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat. We read it, yeah? He, he made the disciples get into the boat. Another version says, I think, he commanded the disciples to get into the boat. Why did he command them to get into the boat? Because Jesus was showing them their miracle moment. He was giving them their monument to say, okay, now you had it. You can't take it away. Kind of like the, the children of Israel when they crossed uh, through, the, uh, through the waters of, uh, they crossed through, the, the, not the Red Sea, the Jordan. You remember when they crossed through the Jordan and they made the monument? So it's kind of, they took the stone, they took the, uh, the stones from the, the center of the Red Sea and they made a monument to remember. That was like, we're always going to remember. I mean, Red Sea also. But we're going to remember, look at what God did. That's a monumental moment. I ain't going to forget that. That's going to shape my, the trajectory of my life from here on out. It will shape. Well, I believe that was a moment like that for the disciples. They had the moment. And then what did Jesus say? He said, now leave and go. Leave it, leave it. You just had it, but leave it and go. Go where? Get into the boat, the church, and go to the other side. What's on the other side? People. So go and take what I've given you and now feed them over there. This is the kind of crux of what I want to hit home. This is the heartbeat of Christianity. you got your moment. You've had your miracle moment. Mine was salvation. I'm like, from now on, man, God, is like, I've seen the hand of God change my life. He broke every addiction, every, every year stronghold in my life. I'm like, there is no going back for me from here on out. Like, like, I've seen God in a new way. Like, it was that pivotal, monumental moment. 
But for many of us, we have that moment and we want to bask in it. We want to like, man, do you know what? Like, I just want to sit. I just want to bathe in the moment. You know, when you have a conference, you've got a good conference. Because we all love conferences, conferences of Christians. We're conference hoppers. So we go to a nice conference and like the glory of God is here. I mean, we've had some of these moments in the promised church where we've gone way past time and, um, and we just want to stay. And that's good, huh? But you're like, I don't want to leave. And we're kind of like clinging to the, the carpet and whatever. You know, you're just like hanging on the walls, just like sucking it up. You know, you're like, I just want to, I just want to keep as much as I can from the atmosphere. I want to, I want to hang on to it as long as possible. That's why you get conference hoppers because they use it like some kind of high. They get this like high monument moment. They want now want another monument moment. But they don't realize the next monument moment is waiting on the other side when they give it away. So the disciples realized, Jesus said, now go and give it away. But for many of us, man, what we're doing is we're hanging in that moment. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to me recently and show me this about the church, not just our church, but about uh, the global church. That there's many people in the church and what we're doing is we're, we've never moved from our monument moment. We, we saw it, we, we, we saw God do it and we're like, I don't want to go. Man, it feels so good being here. It's like God's presence is here. It's like the 12 baskets. You want to just hug the baskets. And you're like, this reminds me of the excess of God. The the 12 baskets are like an overflow of God's goodness. I just want to be by them. I want to hug them. You know, we don't want to leave that place. But we're missing it. We're missing John's and Robin's and a lot of the people in our church who have been brought to Jesus with people who all they have to offer is a crumb or, a, or a, a, a bit of fish, or a bit of bread. We're missing it, because we want to stay right here. Because it feels good here. Let's stay on that monumental moment. Let's just hang out here. But we don't want to get in the boat. And all the while, people are perishing, because you're being selfish. And you're trying to keep to yourself what was never meant to be just for yourself. You see, the Lord has given you excess. We may come here on a Sunday morning and we may say, Lord, I'm coming for my next miracle. I had one before. There's my monumental miracle. I want to come to the promised church. I'm going to go to a conference and I'm going to get another one. I'm going to get another one to keep me going because that one I can't kind of remember. It's quite a long time ago. I want another one. This will keep me strong. It will help me to remember. And we're coming for our miracle on a Sunday morning. And God is gracious and he will feed you on a Sunday morning. But I want to tell you what you're missing. The other six days in the week. You see, there are miracles at the hand of God wants to distribute to you six days of the week as you go about your business, as you're in your work, as you're in your, your, with your family, your friends. There are daily miracles that God wants to bestow upon you and he wants you to partner with him to fulfill. But we're just looking for Sunday. Oh no, my man, when I get to Sunday, you know, then I'll get one there. But God's got them all through the week. His hand is not short. He has multiplication. He has lots. Every day, he has manna for you. Every day, he has a miracle waiting for you. But he's looking for you to step up and take it. So I want to encourage you guys. We still have a community out here, outside our doors that's dying. People are getting saved. The church is growing. Praise God. But there's a lot of people that are perishing right on our very doorsteps. We don't have a license to sit here and say, oh, no, man, we're doing so good. Church is growing. People are getting saved. Man, we can just chill. You know, I'm going to leave that to the professionals. I'm going to let the evangelists or, or those new believers, they're very passionate. They're very zealous. They always shout, Jesus! <laughs> Let's let them do it. But we don't realize, maybe we don't realize that God is actually giving you your monumental moment for a purpose. Maybe it wasn't just for you. Maybe he allowed you to have that moment. Maybe he allowed you to be fed so much fat like a king so you could go and give it away. Because you have excess in your life. And would you even just give a little crumb to somebody? Because that is what they're longing for. People in this community are longing for Jesus. It's so easy to bask in your miracle moment. I know. I've been there, believe me. You want to stay there. It feels good. 
I'll tell you this real quick before I close. I was just so you know, it's, I'm not pointing the finger at you. I'm guilty too, huh? I was, uh, before I became an evangelist, I was a musician. And I, I got saved as a musician. I'm like, I'm going to be a musician. You know, I was telling the Lord, yeah? This is my calling, God, yeah? So I will be a musician. The Lord didn't seem to agree. I'm thankful I listened to the Holy Spirit. Um, but I was, uh, as it was coming to an end, I went to a songwriter. I was invited to a, a vineyard songwriters retreat. All the vineyard movement write songs together in this camp for like a weekend. And they invited me to go and write songs with them. So the Lord used this moment as, as they're like nailing the coffin to say, this ain't you. Uh, this was my last moment. So I got the train uh, uh, through England. They got the train to this place. And as I'm getting up the train, there's a couple of guys. They've got like bulldogs and gold chains smoking weed, a little rough around the edges. And I got up the, uh, the train. And then one of the guys goes here and waits for a cab. And I'm, get, I'm here waiting for a cab too. So I go over and I start sharing the gospel with the guy. Well, actually what I did, he had a, um, stitches down his face from here to here. So I went over and I'm like, what happened to your face, man? He's like, somebody glassed me. I was in a bar fight. They smashed the glass and put a glass in my face. He says, man, I'm in so much pain. I can't sleep at night. I'm in constant pain. So, so I'm like, well, can I pray for your pain? And he's like, yeah, yeah. So I pray for this guy's pain, standing outside the uh, train station, a lot of people going around. And, and basically the guy's like falling asleep. He's like, man, I feel like I could sleep right now. I'm so peaceful. So then I'm like, you know, as we know, we don't just leave it with a, with a physical healing because otherwise what I'm doing is waving that guy on pain free to hell. That's not too good, huh? So what I do, I begin to share the gospel with him. As I'm sharing the gospel, he begins to cry. As the power of God falls upon him, he's crying outside a train station. When I went over to him, he's, he's uh, rolling a joint. And he's on the floor like that. He's sitting down like this, rolling a joint. And I began the conversation with him. And he's like, yeah, I'm just, can I pray for you? And he said, yeah. I said, okay, stand up. Stand up out of respect and put that away. So he stood up and he put it away. And then I prayed for him and the presence of God came. And then as I'm praying and sharing the gospel, he begins to feel the Holy Spirit and he begins to cry. He wasn't the kind of guy to cry. We have many, many of our guys and people, they always say, I'm not the kind of guy who cries and then they all cry. <laughs> it's what happens when you go toe to toe with the Holy Spirit. So this guy's crying and he gives his heart to Jesus and it's like this most beautiful moment. And then you know what happens? Exactly when it is finished, like the timing of the Lord, the cab comes. Perfect time. And I'm like, there's my cab. Get his number. I'm out of here. Now I'm sitting in the cab and I'm like in my miracle moment. Literally. I'm like basking in the, the glory cloud. I'm like, man, this is beautiful. I'm just like, I didn't see that happening. This is incredible. And the taxi driver starts talking to me. And honestly, I'm like, man, be quiet. Leave me alone. Like, honestly. Because all I want to do is bask in the moment. Just leave me a little longer, man. Come on, just a little longer. And I'm like there and I'm just thinking about it. And, and, and he's like, hey, so what, what, what you been up to? Where, where you going? And he's like, I'm thinking just, yeah. And I'm giving like one word answers, you know, leave me alone kind of thing. And I'm just kind of like in this moment, I'm like, and I'm thinking about the guy's face and, and how he got emotional and everything. And then the guy just went going on and on. So then I pick out my phone and I start texting my friend to tell him. I'm like, man, you got to hear what just happened. This is crazy. So I'm like texting and he's still talking to me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just trying to, to shut up because I want, I want to enjoy my moment. I want to enjoy the miracle moment. I don't want to move on. I'm happy where I am. It feels good, man. And then the guy starts chatting and I'm like, okay, God. So I just put the phone away and I'm like, yeah, what's going on with you, man? And then he's like, oh, I've got this, like something wrong with my arm. And he begins to tell me about this pain that he has. I'm like, surely not two, back to back. <laughs> so that got me excited again. I'm like, forget the phone, what's that, man? And I'm like leaning in and he's like, yeah, I've got this problem with my arm and stuff. And I'm like, do you believe in prayer? And he's like, well, I've never really had it like, but I mean, I'm open. So I prayed for the guy. We get to the songwriter's retreat. I'm there for songwriting, not for praying and leading people to Jesus, by the way. So I get there and then the guy's like, like swinging his arm and he's like, man, that's crazy, man. Like, I, like I don't feel it anymore. It's like nuts. And so we, are, we, are, we arrive at the doors of this like fancy, like a castle type place. And he's like swinging his arm and as they let me in, they're like, what, who is this crazy dude? Because they didn't really know me. And this guy's like, man, that's crazy. And so I walk into the songwriter's retreat and I'm like buzzing. I'm like, hi. Uh, like feeling this, you know, sorry, language, but I'm like feeling excited. And, uh, and I get in this moment, like, and I'm feeling the Lord's presence and I go in and I'm just like unleash on these guys who were sat there at the table, like, you know, being all deep and creative. And I'm like, man, this was crazy. Just let this dude to the Lord, get in the cab. Next guy gets healed. And they're like, 
looking at me like, who, what, who is this guy, man? And you know what? It was that moment that I realized that I'm not a musician, but I'm an evangelist. Seriously. That was a, that was a moment for me when I'm like, I'm not the same as these people. Because they didn't get it. They weren't interested. They weren't getting it. They were like, you know, like I was sharing the stories and they're just like, yeah, whatever, man. Just like, let me write songs, yeah? They weren't, they weren't getting it. And that was a, a moment for me where I'm like, this is who I am. And you know what? I began to listen to the Holy Spirit's calling on, on my life. And I could have been wasting my life stuck trying to flog a dead horse as a musician. But when you move in the favor of God, doors open. I never thought that I would be invited personally by Daniel Kalenda, whose ministry has been my, uh, the, the most, um, like the biggest heroes of, of my Christian walk, Reinhard Bonnke, Christ for All Nations. They've been the epitome of evangelism as a ministry for me, growing up as a, as a believer. I never thought that I would be invited personally by the man who was the legacy holder of Christ for All Nations. I never thought that two weeks ago, I would hear him say to over 500 people in a room that there's only three or four evangelists, that the, uh, the top three or four evangelists, Scott is in my top three or four of the ones who carry something special of, of the Lord. I didn't think he would say that. And I'm not telling you to brag, I'm telling you to be honest, to show you that when you flow in the path of the Lord, things open up. Because I resisted God for a long time. I resisted the hand of the Lord for a long time. I'm a musician. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. And I just want to encourage you that maybe you're like, man, I'm just an office worker. I'm just a nurse. I'm just a school teacher, whatever. And the Lord's nudging you saying, you are more than that. I have more for you than that. That is not what you are. I have another identity that you're yet to see. What if your identity was to feed people? What if your identity was to give away what he'd already given you? But in order to do that, you've got to get in your boat and you've got to go to the other side. So my challenge today, the promised church, as I close, will you go to the other side? Are you willing? What's your excuse? I don't have much. I'm, I'm, I, I only do this for a living. I don't have much to give. I'm not experienced. I've never prayed for someone. What is your excuse? Because all your excuses are rendered unexcuseless. Because we've just realized and you've just heard what can happen with only a tiny little amount. So I want to pray as we close. But first, <clears throat> I wouldn't be an evangelist if I didn't give you a chance to respond to Jesus. So I'm going to give you a chance to respond as I close. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus in a real way, maybe you knew a lot about Jesus, like John and Robin, but they weren't living lives that were free. They weren't living lives that were totally set free. They were on the wrong road believing in the right God. Maybe you're on the wrong road believing in the right God. Maybe you're trying to tick a box, but your life says that you're in chains. Your life says you're in bondage. Your life says you're filled with strongholds. You're not free to live the life that Christ died to give you. I want to tell you this. 90% of search and rescue missions, according to the Coast Guard, 90% happen within 20 miles. 90% of rescues happen within 20 miles of the shore. What does that mean? It means you don't have to go very far to find a drowning person. I believe there are some drowning people in here this morning. What does it mean to be drowning? It means this. If you close your eyes on earth tonight, can you say that when you open them and stand face to face with the Lord, that all will be well with your soul? Do you know that you belong to Jesus? Do you know that you're in relationship with Him? Do you know you're on the narrow path that leads to life? Or you're on the wide road, on the wrong road, believing in the right God? Or are you following Him? The Holy Spirit will show you Right now in this moment, Holy Spirit, I ask you, shine a light upon any hearts in this place right now. The Lord showed me a, a picture recently when I was praying. I saw a, a flock of sheep, a lot of sheep, and the sheep were marked. Some were red and some were black. The red ones were the ones that belonged to him and the black ones the ones that weren't. And they were all mixed together. But he was showing me from a bird's eye view the sheep that were his and the sheep that weren't. If you're here and your heart is black and it is not blood red, washed by the blood of Jesus, then he's offering it you today. 
He's saying, I've already paid to mark you with my blood. So I'll uninvite you. If you want to meet Jesus for real, now's your time. I was 24 years of age, stood from a drug overdose, staring down the gates of hell. 15 years of age, I gave 50% of my heart to Jesus. Many of you guys know the story. But at 24, I'm about to die as I see hell. And I realize giving God 50% of me was about to take 100% of me to hell. 50% will not cover you. You give it all or you don't. But don't play around. I'm not talking about you had a bad week, you had a bad month. I'm talking about you don't know Jesus. You're not in relationship with him. So if you want him, here's your chance. As I go, as I leave, I want to ask you, Holy Spirit, if there's anyone in this room, let today be their day in Jesus' name. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to count to three. And then I'm going to ask you to stand if you want Jesus. One, he died on the cross for you personally. Two, he rose again on the third day. Hallelujah. And three, he stands at your side right now and says, come, come, come to me. If you want Jesus and you don't have him and you don't know him, stand, stand, stand in the name of Jesus. Give your life to him. Begin to live for something that is real. Stop playing around at church games. Make it real. If you want to be set free, if you want to come alive, now's your chance. If you all know God, praise God, I'm happy for that. But if there is someone in this room that doesn't know Jesus and you feel the tug on your heart, it's his invitation. Don't waste your life anymore. Start living. I'm going to give you a moment longer. If you want him, here's your chance. I'm not going to labor. Do you want him? Do you want him? Do you want him? Stand. Jesus, have your way. Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Okay, so I just want to pray as we begin to, to close. I want to pray. If you're here this morning, and the Lord is tugging your heart and you're like, man, I've just been staying in my moment. I've been living in my moment. I haven't been, I haven't, you know, I've got in the boat, but I never went anywhere. I stayed in the boat, but I never went to the other side. The Lord wants to commission you this morning. If you've been inspired by my eight-year-old boy and said, well, he didn't have much to give, but even God took what he had and there's the fruit. If you want to get real with the Lord and say, man, I'm going to, I want to start living involved, active in this relationship. And I want to be a rescuer. Now I'm asking you to come <clears throat> and stand. And we're going to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. We give you all the glory and all the praise. If the Lord is touching your heart in this area, come, yeah, either, either, either side. <clears throat> and we'll begin to pray for you guys. Thank you, Jesus.